So we've spent about a day talking about data and about field procedures. And I think that's maybe a little out of order in that we should be talking about why we're doing this sort of thing. And so mostly from here on in this course, we're gonna be talking about the why, you know, essentially what do you get out of it? Um, and you've seen a lot of emphasis about photography and it seems like it doesn't have too much to do with that inventory. So I just wanna take a short bit of time and talk with you about one um, added benefit of linking uh, images of habitats to your biodiversity data. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I'm gonna go through a lot of slides fairly quickly, but I just wanted to share this with you. So this is Mexico City, which is a extremely large city, 22 million people. Uh, it competes with a couple other cities on Earth for being the largest. You can see the urban areas, all of this, it's a valley, it used to have a system of lakes associated with it. The system of lakes is mostly gone. Um, but one really important feature are these two volcanoes. This is called Ixtaxihuatl, and this is Popocatépetl, okay? Uh, the city is very, very densely populated, and it seems to go on forever. This is that same view, the volcanoes would be down here, and you can see it was a big lake system. Of course, we don't have any photography of that because most of those lakes disappeared between 1600 and 1800. That's what the city of Tenochtitlan, which is the precursor of Mexico City, that's what it looked like when the Spaniards arrived in, in the 1500s. Notice very iconic views of those volcanoes. Okay, um, and you can see between 1824, 1929, 1959, 1980, up to present, you can see the extent of those lakes diminishing progressively. And now really it's only this lake down in the south that you really can, can see. And that's the, what do you guys call it, ajolote? How do you pronounce it? Axolotl? Oh my god. Axolotl. <laughs> <laughs> it's a type of salamander that's endemic to these lakes. Yeah. Um, interestingly, there was a very vibrant um, natural history scientific community in Mexico in the late 1800s. They published this journal and one other, and they are very, very high quality scientific publications. I would say that these, this series of publications rivals what the Smithsonian was doing at the same time. Um, and you had a very interesting mixture of science and art. And so, for example, this is one of the publications in that journal, and it's called uh, The Hummingbirds of Mexico by this man, Rafael Montes de Oca. Okay, very beautiful paintings with it. So believe it or not, we're gonna talk about landscape art. We're not gonna talk about biology, just for a minute. This is Jose Maria Velasquez, Velasco Gomez. You can see he lived through the second half of the 19th century. And Velasco is very famous for two things. One is that he was the scientific illustrator for the Mexican National Museum of Natural History. And the other is for these landscape paintings. And sorry about the quality. This is a view across Mexico City. You can see the city is here. You're up on the west wall. And notice here in the background are those two volcanoes. Ixtaxihuatl is always broader and longer, and Popocatépetl is more like a cone, okay? So you can use that trick to know that here you're west because Ixta is north of Popo, okay? There are, the, there are the volcanoes all over again, but a different view. There are the volcanoes yet again, and a different view. And there's yet another view. So this is something that Velasco did. It was essentially a symbol of Mexico. And my guess is that they didn't pay him very much as museum illustrator. And so he was building these very iconic views of very important 
sites across Mexico and selling them for extra income. That's, that's my inference. Here's the painter in his studio, okay, late in his life. Now, I got a very interesting opportunity in that I got, I had always admired those paintings. There's basically one floor in Mexico's National Art Gallery, which is all Belasco paintings. Uh, and a, with a couple of colleagues in Mexico and a couple of colleagues from Kansas, we decided, well, what do those landscapes look like now? And so this man is Luke Jordan, a good friend of mine in Kansas. He is a, a, an instructor in photography. And Luke usually does, I think, photography like this. But he accepted the challenge of doing these really, really strange landscapes. And so the Atlantic Ocean is right over here. You can see a bit of the coast there. Here's Mexico City. And each of these crosses is a site where Belasco did a major identifiable landscape painting. This is about 15 paintings, and we have about 43 left to go. Um, this is one of my favorite. It's, so here's Mexico City. The volcanoes are here. OK? And so remember, Ixta was north of Popo, but here we're going to see them from the east instead of from the west. And sure enough, there's Ixta and Popo, but we were seeing them from over there. And that's what, that's what Belasco saw in the 1890s. Here's what we saw last year. And if you look very carefully, the two views are not at all different. It's a little bit more population here, but the land use really doesn't change. Okay? Let's go on to another site. These are some very important pyramids. It's actually two pyramids. One is the Pyramid of the Sun. The other is the Pyramid of the Moon. That's um, viewing one, from, one pyramid from the top of the other and there before and after. A little bit of a problem of perspective because the very top of the pyramid that we're standing on for this photograph is off limits because it's a UNESCO World Patrimony Site and such. Another pyramid site, so we're up northeast of Mexico City. Another pyramid view is this. And again, the view isn't perfect. Immediately to our left, you can see, see this fence. There's a fence and a sign that says military reservation. But we needed to be about 300 meters that way. And so in good uh, disrespectful US American fashion, I jumped the fence. And I told the photographer to jump the fence. And then he pointed out that there was live ammunition firing going on. So I jumped back over the fence. <laughs> Anyhow, here you can see quite a bit of infilling of human activity between the pyramids and beyond the area between them. OK, now we're going to go far east. So this is in Veracruz. This is not one of the two famous volcanoes. This is called Pico de Orizaba, or Citlaltepetl. It's the highest point in Mexico. It's just over 5,000 meters. So it beats Mount Cameroon, sorry. Um, watch old and new old and new. And really, you know, we're looking at this little settlement here, okay? But really the land use has not changed much at all. Uh, hmm? Well, so that's something, let me take you back, sorry. I was gonna point that out later, but I'll point it out now. Sorry about this. Old and new. And notice that the snow is down to the skirts. And that's because there was a snowstorm the night before. Which is to say, there was a rainstorm here, and up there it was a snowstorm. Uh, but that's a really crucial thing. If your old photography is good enough, 
You can track things like tree line shifts, snow line shifts, okay? These new photographs, you know, we're all happy when we get like a 15 megapixel camera or a 20 megapixel camera. These are something on the order of two or three gigapixels. Because what the photographer is doing with these is he's taking dozens of photographs and then stitching them together. So that's how you can get, it's hard to see on this background, but you can see a cat playing in the yard of this house and you can see the peak in incredible detail. Okay, now we're swinging down south. Uh, we get this view, and this is Popocatepetl and Ixtaxihuatl. Okay, so now we're southeast of the mountains, and we get this view. And look at the landscape change. Okay? And we were incredibly lucky that we could even get this view. This is what we were kind of climbing up through. Another view, that stream has disappeared under a housing area. Now we're coming back around into the federal district. Now we have Ixta north of Popo, um, and so we're straight west basically, old and new, okay? This, this landscape is so changed that it was almost impossible to figure out where we were. One last site, um, and for those of you who know my wife, she was born right here, like less than a kilometer from this site. Um, actually, she grew up there, didn't, wasn't born there. Old and new, okay? If there are any of Catholic faith in the, uh, in the group, uh, that is the, the shrine to the Virgin of Guadalupe, who's considered the patron saint of the Americas. Uh, but look at the change. And there's a very interesting dimension of the change. Notice that in every single photograph, every single old painting I've shown you that is around the Valley of Mexico, you see those volcanoes. And my wife tells stories in the 1960s about waking up and every morning seeing those volcanoes. And you go now, and they're gone. So literally, the visual environment of Mexico City has changed because it's back there in that haze. We've mirrored those uh, landscape changes with analyses, thanks to those early scientific journals, analyses of change in the avifauna over a hundred years. And essentially you can see, uh, let's see, non-native species are these, and there were actually more non-native species reported from the Valley of Mexico in the 1800s than in the 2000s. And we see this aquatic component declining rather substantively. And then we also see the migratory component expanding somewhat, and that's mainly m thinking about uh, changes in birding intensity. You know, essentially, there are more observers who are paying more attention. Um, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but this is a, a blackbird that, that went extinct, and it was uh, originally described Remember Goldman? We were looking at his field notes a moment ago. Uh, there was a series collected by him just west of Mexico City. Well, this, um, this article published, I think, just around when I was born, argues that there's no record of this species from the Valley of Mexico, and only known from west of Mexico City. The type locality of Casadex palustris should thus be cor corrected to the marshes of the headwaters of the Rio Lerma in the state of Mexico. This was way back, but I went into those scientific journals from the 1800s and found, let's see, here we go in, in this journal, notes on the vertebrates of the Val Valley of Mexico and where is it? Let's see. 
Quisculus tenu tenuirostris, which is a, a synonym of Quisculus palustris, and it, it was known from the Valley of Mexico. Different author, and we're going to see it again. Here we go, Quisculus tenuirostris. And in one case, they're even reporting Quisculus tenuirostris and Quisculus mexicanus, which is the dominant grackle now. And so we had very good evidence by which to take that type locality and move it back to Mexico City. So we just talked about art. What's the deal, right? But what we're looking at is change. Now this is going to depend on the sort of thing that Dave just mentioned, anticipating the whole talk. If there are photo archives, they may be here, they may be in the British Museum, they may be in lots of places, but they offer you the opportunity to get a very unique view of landscape change in your country. So remember Goldman and Nelson, those guys who marched around Mexico for 20 some years. Here are some of the photographs that they took, which are identifiable landscapes. That's one of them. So the idea is this, and this is, this is essentially where the story ends, which is to say this is something I want to do soon. What if we were to detect the big archives of historical photos that were taken by collectors, the same photographs that we've been talking to you about the last two days, but from the old collectors? You could post them on websites and challenge researchers to retake those same photographs, just the way we did with the paintings in the, uh, from the 19th century, and to redo the biodiversity inventories. So that is essentially a very, very nice, elegant master's thesis or doctoral thesis. Look at the landscape change and look at the biodiversity change. The spectacular thing about photographs like that is that associated with that landscape are a bunch of specimens in the Smithsonian Institution. And we have the same thing in the University of Kansas. And you know, certainly there will be, for Cameroon or Uganda or Malawi, there will be some old collector who did a good job of documenting his or her work with photographs. You have to look, they can be very hard to find. Um, but what we can imagine is a big cooperative, uh, cooperative effort that would provide a very novel view of habitat change and how it translates into biodiversity change. Okay, so that's just a, a quick vignette designed to give you an idea of why do we get all this additional information? And we'll come back to those topics later today. Any questions? <laughs>